Good afternoon. How's everyone doing? Good? How has the conference been so far? All good? Okay. So, um, last talk of the day. So, first of all, thank you for being here. <laughs> so, the name of this talk is Your Board is Trying to Tell You Something. And so, you know, I am the last speaker, so I'm the proverbial last person who stands between you and drinks. So, uh, my colleague Alexis Zeglov tweeted this today, just to make sure we connect the dots. Um, and we, um, we know what this talk is really about. So, uh, my name is Fernando. Uh, I am part of Squirrel North. We are a partnership of uh, Kanban coaches and trainers from Canada. We are all based in, um, for the most part, Toronto. And, well, there are three of us here in the conference. If you'd like to know more about us, just approach us and let's talk about that, our story and the th kind of things we do. Or you can go to our website and read more about our story and the type of services we offer and the material we have out there. Um, so, we know that knowledge work tends to hide in unlikely places. Um, that is, you know, by nature is invisible. It's uh, something we can't see, so it's very easy for work to just pile up and accumulate. If it decays and it runs out of shape, we can't see that, we cannot smell that. So it's, it's intractable, right? Now, we in Kanban have a countermeasure for that. If the clicker cooperates. Oh, there we go. So, in Kanban, we have a general principle that has to do with visualization. Visualize your work, right? And that's the, that's the countermeasure we have for this problem of work being invisible. And usually, it materializes in boards that look like this, initially at least. Um, whether these boards are physical, you know, stickies on the wall, or digital, that's a different concern. So all, all what I'm about to say applies to both, really. But the point is we have a countermeasure for that problem. We have boards that look like that, and sometimes there are these simple three columns to do in progress done, and that it's enough for you know, an initial improving the situation for most organizations. It's a good first step. Now, the thing is, um, you know what? I'm going to change the clicker. So strategic change here. Okay, perhaps we shouldn't use clickers at all. All right. So, um, so we start with simple visualization boards. We, that gives us a, gra a great first step. The next thing that happens is we, uh, we stand in front of these boards to have conversations, right? So that's, that's what we build them. Now, something I have observed in many cases is that these boards tend to fade into the background. Right? It's very common for teams to just stand in front of these boards, have the cursory update of it moving stickies, and then the conversation switches away, and they are not used to their full potential. And that's a shame, because there's lots of information that is radiating out of these boards. There's lots of untapped potential there to get insights into what the team is really, or what the process is, is, is really about, and what's really happening. So this is what this talk is really about, is bringing awareness to design decisions we can make so that information that comes out of these boards 
you know, it's, 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 it's helping us guide the evolution of the process and attune our ears to things that are actually coming out of these worlds, even if we don't design them explicitly that way. There are things that are going to be told, uh, told to us. So, uh, in general terms, we're going to be talking about uh, four things. So first is the visualization of work, work items. But that's not the only things we see on a board like this. We see the work, but we also see things like the process we follow. What is the workflow we follow to process the work? That's also visualized there. Uh, perhaps not as, you know, as easily understood, there is also an idea of uh, visualization of commitment in the world. It's an idea of how we make commitments, where commitment points happen. And finally, there is process policies. What are the rules we follow to, uh, to, to play the game, essentially? So we're going to be covering those four areas. Now, before moving on, uh, a few general comments. Everything what I'm about to say today here is on supporting of, in support of this principle of evolutionary change. Start from where you are and evolve from there. Um, the last thing I'd like to see is that you take all these things I'm going to say as a checklist of we need to do all these things and visualize all these, these things this way. Well, there may be things here that are completely inappropriate in your context or in your level of maturity. Um, so it's, everything is about recognize where you are, start from there, visualize that, and evolve. Right? Now, once you start visualizing things, you may not like what you see. But that's the whole point. You can stand back and observe. That's what the board is, is there for. Observe what's, what's coming out. There's going to be things you put in your board, design decisions you make, that hopefully add, they, they, they will help you ask or answer specific questions that you have about how your process or your, or your work happens. So stand back, observe. Maybe decide on some action then. But don't stop there. Also listen to what your board is telling you. So there are things, there is this information that is going to be coming out of your board if you pay attention, if you listen to what your board is telling you. Um, even if you didn't design the board that way to answer that specific question, it's, it's, it's information that is going to be radiating to you that is going to give you insights. So act on that insight. Let's do something about it and maybe introduce some sort of change. All right, so let's start with visualization of the work itself. That's, that's the first thing we usually talk about when we talk about visualization. Visualize, visualize your work. So let's say you ask the team you work with or the group you work with to just take inventory of the work you do. And you will come up most likely with something that looks like that. Um, so a question we could ask is what, what should we visualize? What, what are the things we should put on the board? Should we put all that stuff on the board? And, well, one, one clue to answer that question could be to start seeing where, where is the work coming from? Where does it originate? And if your team is like most of the teams I've, I work with, you will find that the work comes from different sources. It comes from different places. Sometimes it originates directly in the team, but sometimes it comes from the various actors around the team, your customers. It's not a single customer. Usually you attend the needs to different people. So that's one thing. And if you look at the work, you will see that you're dealing really with different animals. So it's, it's not that all your work is homogeneous. You will deal with multiple things. So, well, perhaps you deal with product features and implementation tasks and production issues. So there's, there's heterogeneity in your, in your demand. So one thing that you know, is, is normally to see that we, we or, or teams end up calling all these stories. So what, what do you visualize? I visualize my stories. And we call everything a story. So the problem with calling everything a story is that it kind of encourages you to treat all your work in the same way, as if it were the same things, when in reality they're very, very different things. So the first thing I would consider, the first thing I, I, I work with teams to, to understand is, well, you have different things. You work with different things. Treat them differently. Show them as different things because they are different. So use some sort of device to just tell you, or essentially you can stand back and answer a, a question like this. What are the different things we work on? Because we don't work on just one type of things. We probably work on many different things. So what are those? Can we make those visible in your design? You know, using colors is one way. You could use colors for other reason, or you could use shapes or some sort of tag, some sort of differentiation that tells you, well, these are the different things we work on. Now, the other question is, should we put all that on the board? And, well, uh, 
one thing I've noticed or, or I've, I've eventually realized is that whatever it is that you visualize, those are the things that you will be talking about, right? So it will direct or focus your attention on some things. So if mostly you visualize internal tasks, most of your conversation is going to be about internal inwards looking or inwards focused work, right? Well, perhaps maybe I, something you could consider is, well, let's focus on visualization of those things that are customer recognizable. Or one, one of the things I help teams to, to move towards is, can we focus our visualization on those things that are meaningful to your customers? So start switching them towards uh, something that is more customer focused, right? Rather than just visualizing all the internal tasks that keep us busy. Now this is not to say completely ignore the yellow tickets, they don't exist. What I'm saying is, can you frame your work in a way that is customer focused? Perhaps all those things are, are the things that are better stored in some sort of electronic tool attached to any of the others, right? But can we start switching the conversation towards items that are customer recognizable so that we can answer that question? What are the deliverables we're working on? It's not just the things we work on. What are we committed to deliver? What are the things that are, are part of our deliverables? The, the next aspect we could consider when we talk about visualizing work is the ticket design. So most teams start with just a single ticket where we write the name of the task or the name of the story we're working on, perhaps a reference to the, to the tracking system. But there is much more information you can actually display. Now this is just an example of things you could show. The important thing to notice here is that the information or the purpose of this, the information of a rich ticket design is not documentation. This is not about putting all the documentation on the wall. I've seen teams attempting that and they end up with a wall plastered with paper, with acceptance criteria and descriptions and lots of, lots of documentation. That's not the purpose. The purpose here is information to guide decision making. So we'll be standing in front of a board full of these tickets. Teams need to make decisions about what to process next, how to get the work going. Well, we need information to make those type of decisions. That's the, that's the things that, those are the things that we need to think about to put on the ticket. So in this particular example, Something like this, for example, is a table that tells you what are your dependencies. Are these the dependencies we need to deal with in order to pull in this ticket? Are we ready to engage with these groups? Or these are the groups we need to engage with. So again, it's um, finding ways to answer questions like this. Because those are the things we need to consider in order to get the work moving. So um, decision making versus documentation. We can also visualize blockers. A very common thing I'm sure most of you have seen is just you tag blocked items with a red ticket that indicates this ticket is not moving. Great first step, but what about things like additional information there? So you can ask questions like that. You can stand back and observe, answer, and, and get some questions like, why is it not moving? Is there any commonality on the, on the, on the reason why tickets don't move? So, we can start adding more richer information in the blockers so that you can harvest those tickets eventually and do some blocker clustering, for example, analyze your sources of delay. Now, once your work is, you know, you've made some decisions about visualizing the work, it comes the time to design the board, the, 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 you know, the columns, visualizing the workflow. So how do we go about that? Let's say you just approach the group or the team and you ask, well, how, what's your process? Most likely, you're going to get an answer that looks like that. It's a description of the different activities different people do in the order where it most likely occurs, right? So based on that, a board design emerges that looks like that. It mimics the activities of people, right? Now, it, that works most of the times until it gets weird and it doesn't because, you know, work starts moving backwards and jumps columns and maybe just doesn't even follow that in some cases because we said demand is heterogeneous, right? So there has to be a better way and there is and we know that for a while we, in the common community we've known this. So Alexis Zeglov has written extensively about this, so has David. This idea of uh, modeling the work as a series of knowledge discovery activities, accumulation of information. So. Um, what does that mean? It means that we need to focus not on handoffs, so how work moves from person to person, but how we accumulate knowledge along the way. So this is the way I, I like to think about it. So imagine that you're with a group of people, you need to climb that tower, 
just you want to get to the top to just observe the view. And you need to get into different floors and maybe this is tricky how to get from one third to the other. So as the group moves, they need to figure out how to do the how to take that journey. You need to make the decisions. The pattern of conversations will change depending on who's in who's climbing or who's not, what the context is. But the point here is we want to get to the top. There is a journey we need to make. Floor one, floor two, floor three. That's why tickets don't go back, right? Because information accumulates from we have none of it to we have all the information we need to deliver. Along the way, well, we don't lose knowledge, hopefully, right? So that's why tickets don't go back. But the conversation amongst the people who need to make those discoveries will vary from ticket to ticket, from work, piece of work to piece of work. So we will go from discovery to discovery to discovery learning what is that we need to know in order to deliver work. So that's what we mean by um, stages of knowledge discovery. So going back to our, our world, if, if these are the stages we think we need to do, going through a process of knowledge discovery means that in each of these columns, what will happen is collaboration amongst different specialties attempting to answer questions like the ones you see there, right? So the work that happens here in the specification column is not the work of the analyst. The work of the analyst may be the most significant work that happens there, the dominant activity at this point. But there's lots of collaboration with other people because we are all together trying to answer a question like this. So do we understand what this is? So there's, there's a lot of analysis going on, but there may also be some testing and some implementation and some other work that has nothing to do with all this. Right? But it's all at the service of this. And once we have enough of this information, we move to the next stage, where maybe the dominant activity shifts. So in this. In this column, high-level design, is not the work of the architect. It's the collaborative work of the team to answer a question like this. Do we know how to build this thing? So we move from something that is vaguely understood to understood. Now we need to figure out from understood to design and so on. Right? So this is what we mean by knowledge of, uh, but stages of knowledge discovery. And the bottom line is that if we do this, what we end up visualizing is not the work people do or the, the handoffs but the stages the work needs to go through. So regardless of what happens for this specific or this particular piece of work, depending on, regardless of what particular combination of interactions need to happen for this piece of work, work will have to go through stages that are in general like this. Right? And the question that I should be able to answer if I stand back and I look at my board is this question here. So how do we discover the knowledge that we need to discover in order to deliver something? Right? So what is our process for knowing what is that we need to do? Right? So that's what this, this, this is where the columns come from. Now imagine that you have that board already and uh, you know, work starts flowing. You can start observing things. Right? So let's say you take an initial piece of work. The, the first stage happens and we look at it. And at that point, it's very common to see that one piece of work becomes you know, a, a bunch of other pieces. It, it splits, right? It, it multiplicates in other, in other pieces because we understand it better, we decide to split it somehow. Now, after that, something interesting happens. The different pieces start moving kind of independently. They follow their own route until they all have to recombine at one point down the, down the road. And after that, they start moving together again. So this is one of those cases where I'm telling you, if, what I was mentioning before, your board will start sending you signals and telling you things. So here is something, there's a signal coming out. Something is happening here if you observe this pattern occurring, right? So maybe what's happening is that you've discovered this point where work splits. There's a split point in the workflow. The work gets to this point, and this point, it multiplicates, right? And then there's another point down the road, downstream, where it recombines, it reassembles. Essentially. And in between, you have this thing I'm calling like a packet switching section. It's like a, you know, packets moving in a packet switched network where every packet moves in its independent route. They're more or less independent, but they need to reach some sort of destination. So if you're observing this, this pattern happening, and that's it's something I see very, you know, very commonly in, 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 many, in many teams, well, there, there's some story happening there. There's something, the board is telling you something, and that something is that perhaps there is. You could think of another item that actually represents the collection of items that move between these two points that essentially represents a higher level of abstraction. So you're, 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 you've discovered perhaps a, hier a hierarchy of work items. Or, or what your board is telling you is that there, there may be something else you could represent 
to, uh, or you could use to represent this collection of things that suddenly move together in a pattern, right? So some people call that epics or features or capabilities, or some, some sort of higher level item that could be used to describe the collection of individual pieces. Um, so those higher level items could be visualized in its own board, for example, and it has its own workflow. So once you start discovering that, is when teams starts, they, they start noticing at this point that, well, these things we work on actually are part of a larger things we don't have a name for, or if we have a name, we don't use it much, but it has a life of its own, and it's larger than the work we do. So this is how awareness of larger end-to-end -end workflow starts, can start appearing. Because as you can see here, what teams are used to see is this part of the world, but this is only a column in a larger workflow for a larger ticket that represents something probably customer recognizable at that point. All right? So workflows for items at that level extend beyond the team. There is an upstream portion, there is a downstream portion. The team is only a part of that. Maybe other teams involved, for example. So you this is how you can start visualizing the fact that if, you, if I look at the problem at this level, let's say epics, features, well, there is many of them and they have to go through you know, some process and different teams get involved. So once I have this, I can start asking questions like, you know, how, uh, oops, let's go back to it. So what are the multiple teams that are involved in delivering something and what's the coordination needs that I have? Right? In this case, it seems that there are two teams involved in delivering things at this level, if I look at that level. Uh, I can also start getting some awareness of interconnection between teams. The same thing can happen between a team working you know, with items at this level connected to other teams that provide some sort of shared service. So I could start visualizing that in separate words and making connections between those and asking questions like this. How are our services interconnected? Can, can my board help me ask, uh, answer that question? Now, um, if we go back to the to the, the other example. So we said, well, work gets into this particular column, it reassembles. There is something else that sometimes happens, or I've seen very often actually, is that, well, once, once the work gets there, it, everything reassembles, and now they all move together again, right? So in this case, let's say individual epics arrive to the business acceptance, and once they are all there, they start moving in, in, in lockstep fashion to the rest of the workflow. So again, what we're, your, your board may be telling you here is that you have a different type of item there. So at this point, there has, the, the, the example where this, uh, the team where this example comes from is, it, it was something that you would notice by looking at the board and by listening at the team conversation, right? So once the board gets into that column, the conversation wasn't about stories and epics anymore. It was all about the release or the package, as they would call it. So everything from this point forward wasn't stories or epics. It was the package. So at this point, what happens is one work item transforms into something else. They need to get all together. So now we are dealing with a different work item type. This work item type has different rules. It has different um, policies attached. Maybe different groups are involved here. It, it follows slightly different rules of the game. So it might be, that may be an interesting thing to visualize or to make, to make explicit, the fact that there has been some transformation here. And this can help us answer questions like that. So how, how is that we're batching the work? Do we have even an awareness of the fact that we're batching stuff? What, what is, what is uh, what's the impact to flow efficiency on that? What's the life cycle of our, our work if we look at that larger scale? The next thing that visualizing the workflow can help us get insights on is how or where work waits. So as, as you know, you can, you can consider each column in your board as having two inner columns, uh, the doing and the done column, essentially one being active and then waiting to be pulled into the next stage, either because there is some sort of constraints in the, in the whips or because simply there's no people available, or essentially work is waiting. So, once you start doing that, you, get, you start getting more uh, or better understanding of places where your work tends to wait. Where are the places where essentially flow stops or uh, slows down? Right? Now, it, it doesn't always happen like this. It's, this is not, not the only possible visualization, and sometimes it's not even that clear. Sometimes the, 
um, the different steps have names. So th th this example comes from another team where we, st we started analyzing ex essentially how do you work, um, this was a scrum team, so within your sprint, what happens between starting the work and declaring it ready? Well, there were lots of intermediary waiting stages, right? So uh, we do testing, but before we can proceed, there has to be a peer review, but before that, there is a waiting stage until something else happens when we do the pull request, blah, blah, blah. So by making all these waiting, waiting periods explicit, it becomes more clear to the team where the work tends to pile up, what are the dependencies we have, who can work in every stage, and does this make any sense? Is, does, is this process helping us or, or actually hurting us? Right? So by making your, uh, your cues or your waiting, your waiting stages more, more explicit, you can get an insight on where your flow is being interrupted. What are the significant interruptions to flow? Where does the work get stuck, essentially? Now, uh, so then what about the to-do in progress done board? So is that, uh, am I saying that this is a useless board? And no, not at all. It's a very useful first step, but I tend to consider this a transitional first step. So that's why sometimes I see teams that use this, this type of visualization forever. And well, there is lots of information coming out of this that could be used to improve their, their situation, but you know, it's, we, we can't really see it because this board doesn't, doesn't send you those signals that clearly. So uh, I would consider this a transition initial step towards something more explicit. And you know, the, the question I would ask, or uh, you know, if, I'm, if I'm managing a team that is, is using this type of visualization is what is that my, I need my team to see and try to evolve my board in that direction so the team can start seeing those things. So a way I found uh, it's useful to just help evolve out of this is we make the in-progress column really, really wide, and then we ask people to move tickets in between, saying, well, what's your stage of completion of this, from 0% to 100%? Because that starts giving us, giving, us an, uh, giving us an idea that there is movement within this column. And maybe we can start finding patterns. So maybe we find that most of the work gets to the 50% mark, and there's, that's where it waits, or close to the end, and there's, that's where it waits. So by asking questions about what happens, there are columns that may start emerging the workflow becomes a little more explicit and we can unlock other, other visualization aspects. Moving on to policies now. So policies are, as you probably know, the rules of the game. So what are the, what are the different rules that we've agreed we're going to follow in order to process the work? And there tends to be two aspects when it comes to visualization of policies, two, two types of things. So on one hand we have, this is, and this is the most common one, when people visualize their policies, usually this is the first thing they do, is the conventions on how to read the board, right? Because you know, you, you can't just stand in front of the board and automatically understand what it is, so you, you need to have some sort of legend, right? So this is the most common one. But the one that I find that is more useful and it's more uh, illuminating for teams is the second one, which is what are the rules that we follow to make decisions? So if anyone has attempted to park in Montreal, that's where the picture comes from, then you understand why it's important to have that visualized. <laughs> um, and, and the problem there is not just French. Anyway, so, uh, so for the e examples of the first kind, I'm referring to things like this. So it, it, it usually boils down to some sort of legend that you attach to the board that tells you how to read the elements that you see. Things like, what do the colors mean? So in the first, uh, in the example on the left, so in this case, for example, color means work type. We're using this to represent the different things we work on. But that's not the only use of color, so maybe we can use color to represent which team is working on. So this, this example comes from a consolidated board for a group of teams working on the same product, and it was organized by feature, and it was important to know which team was involved in which feature, because it was collaboration. So the way we did that is by visualizing with colors which team is which, team is which and what was the mix, right? So you, can we see if we're working, several teams working on the same feature or not, for example. But it's not the only thing, obviously. You have things like these. So these are uh, definitions of what do we see? So if we call something a blocker, what do we mean by a blocker? If we mean issue, what do we, what do we mean by issue? 
or rules about how to write the stickies, what are the different icons we see, or even how are we going, are we going to understand our backlog? So when we, when we throw things in the backlog, what do we throw there and how are they connected, things like that. So essentially, how do I read the board legend? Now, the, the, second, the second type of thing, this is the one that is more interesting. It has to do with making explicit how which rules are we following really to move work along? Because that's going to have an impact on how we make decisions. And then we can start asking, does the process actually make any sense? Does it make sense to have this condition, for example, at this point? Or should, we, should it be earlier in the workflow or later? Right? Now, uh, it's very common for agile teams to have definitions of done, for example. And what they mean is, essentially, the, the rules just to put things in this column. And what this shows is, that, well, you can, you can take the definition of done or any rules you follow and spread them in, the, in your workflow to see where the different parts of the definition of done occur. It, that may be very relevant. So in this case, for example, uh, we say, well, in order to go from here to here, from merge into the branch to testing, we need to have all the test cases identified, which means that probably that's going into some sort of delay, right? Or, well, we need to issue a pull request before we transition from here to here. And the, in, in the example where this, in the, in the team where this example came from, uh, we made this visible and somebody in the team said, well, I didn't really know that at this point is where we made the pull request. <laughs> I was waiting for something else to happen. So making these things explicit helped the team play by the same rules. Let's make sure we all follow the same rules to process the work. Otherwise, we risk con confusions like that, which may introduce further delay or defects or things like that. So, do we agree on what the rules are? What are the rules? So these are, these are the stand back questions that visualizing policy should help me with. So one quick note about the first, uh, or um, policies around the first column, because the first column is kind of special. So if we have something in the to-do column, or the first column, or the options column, it needs to move into the workflow. Well, that represents commitment. That's kind of special. So uh, things to... Uh, Make sure we agree or in honest questions like this. So what should I pull in next? And can I pull it now? So that speaks about selection and capacity. So large, big topic, so I just will briefly touch on it. But one way of thinking about this or, or maybe visualizing this is, well, we, let, let's agree on cost of delay profiles or classes of service, so we know in which order we pick the items and how we treat them after that. So that will help us with the selection problem. And then in terms of capacity, well, the, the, the way we tend to manage that, or one of the ways is through whip limits. As you know, you can add these numbers at the top of the columns, indicating how many tickets you can get there. Um, but you know, it, it, it can also happen that you have whip limits in lanes to allocate capacity across different work types. It's not just columns, so that's, that's how we would visualize it. Or uh, you could also visualize it by using physical slots in the board. That's another way. So not, you don't really own numbers, just physical spaces in the board. And that's, that's how you know how many slots you have available. So that's another way of visualizing limits in the, in the, in the, in the capacity. And, I skip to that. and finally, commitment. Let me ask you a question. Is this guy committed? How do you know? Yeah, so it's no way back, right? So we've just, you know, no way that in the middle of the air we're going to say, oh, I really should go back to the rock right now. All right, so in simple terms here, let's say, well, we have something in the first column and we need to move into the workflow. Um, well, that represents some sort of commitment. And something I found is when and you start working with a team or a group of people that are managing a service, the, sometimes commitments are made in ways that are not clear to everyone or even it's not clear where we make commitments. So one way I've been handling this is I ask people to visualize that with a red line on the board. Saying, well, put a line where you think this is where we make commitments. So to this side of the, of the, of the line, to this side of the red line, it means this is an option. We could drop it at any time, so we've made no promises. But if we cross the line, we've made the promise to someone. So, well, if we, want to, if we need to break the promise, there has to be some sort of cost. Otherwise, there would be no commitment, right? Well, so where is that line? And that opens a whole interesting set of conversations with, you know, it's not clear for people where, is, where are these commitments. 
So uh, sometimes we just put the line and then we find that things actually are born on this side of the line. By the time that the team hears of something, it has crossed the line already. And that starts opening you know, interesting conversations afterwards. Now, um, the next question you can ask at that point is, OK, you've, you've crossed the line, but what do you mean by commitment in this case? So how, how far are you committing to go? So, so we know that once you introduce something in a, in a workflow, if you start discarding work or stopping it, that has implications in terms of flow. So when we cross this line, are we sure that we meant to go up to here? Is that what we mean by commitment? So crossing, put it, pulling something across the red line, it means that we really, really mean to go here? Or are we uh, entertaining the notion that maybe we will get discarded in between? So you know, we start something just because we think that this is a good idea, but you know, we'll drop it if we have to and switch to something else. And that, you know, that may be fine, but are we even aware of that? Are we even aware of that, uh, that, you know, that that situation is happening? So this is a way I, I found to visualize that thing as well. So is we visualize the commitment point in red, and we say, well, crossing this line means that we have the intention of going from here to here. So we can start having conversations about, are we ready to pull this in? So what are the minimum things we, we, we need to have so that when work enters, we can proceed it to the end, right? So, is, is the word ready? Is, is maybe some, or, or, or maybe there is some step here in between that needs to be added so that we prepare the word to enter before we make commitments. So what is the span for commitments? Are we committing to things too soon? So it's a very crude visualization device, but it opens the conversation around the meaning of commitment and the readiness on are, are we committing too soon or too early? So it, it helps starting that conversation. Now, when that happens, as I mentioned before, it opens these very interesting conversations about what commitment really is and commitment to whom and to what. Because uh, if you're dealing with one single team, usually the world is here, but as we discussed earlier, maybe the world that I, the, the world that I visualize here is part of a larger, work show, a, a larger workflow of, cast, of other customer recognizable items. So let's say this, are, this is your storyboard and this is your epic board. Right? Now the commitments or the, the promises made at this level are very different than the promises made at this level. So the customers are probably looking at this level. Right? So commitment at that point may be further upstream respect to the team. So the, the, the interesting conversation that happens once, we, once I start putting these red lines in boards is that people start asking, well, you know, if, if we talk about promises, this thing we're working on, we've promised it already. Now we're, we're grooming it and we are uh, uh, developing it now, but there is a promise already done. So where, where was that promise? What was that promise done? Well, it turns out that there is a whole process before that that is upstream, completely invisible. So putting this red line sometimes unlocks that conversation and brings awareness of an ex the existence of another process that is upstream, that deals with a different level of granularity of items, and you know, even sometimes there is another process downstream. Who cares about each level of commitment, essentially? All right. To wrap up, listening to your board, um, we went through you know, a series of different uh, questions that you could ask from your board. So when you design your board, depending on which questions you're interested in, in, in um, let me step back of that. You can design your board so that it helps you answer questions. Questions like this, we've, we've, we've been through some of these during the presentation. These are not the only ones. These are probably not relevant to everyone. But these are some of the, some of the questions I have in mind when I think of this problem is, if, if, I, need, if I need my team to understand, my team, I, my, the, the, the service I'm working with, to, un, to understand certain aspects of their delivery, what are the design elements I can put on my board that help me answer this? And usually, that means going beyond the to do in progress done columns, right? So that's, that, that board usually doesn't give you that. But at the same time, once the board has been designed and it answers some questions, we need to start listening to what happens because it, there's, there's going to be patterns emerging out of the movement of staff on the board. So, uh, so, so what, what, is the, what is the message that you think this board is sending? Which one is the obvious one? In progress column, lots of stuff. <laughs> So this team was asking, why, why is our work taking so long? 
well, okay, your board is actually giving you a clue. <laughs> you have lots and lots and lots of stuff in progress, plus this is the upstream portion, right? So start looking for patterns, places where work accumulates. The other, the other thing we can see here is, in this case, uh, this is the case where colors, uh, which one was this? So color of ticket here represents type of work. So a question you can ask in front of this board is, is this the right mix, for example? So, and that's a conversation I remember I had with the person running, the, the product manager for this. So, if, if these are features and the blue tickets are, um, I think there were system enhancements and the red tickets were defects, well, is this the right mix that makes sense into your situation? Is, is, this, is this how you should be focusing your team? We can have that conversation based on that, observing that pattern. How is the work accumulating here? So, Patrick Steyer talks about the barbell flow, for example, where work in the upstream portion uh, bulges at the beginning of the workshop and then uh, of the workflow and then at the end and it you know reduces to a smaller size in the middle so if you observe that that, that may be an indication of unevenness in the in your upstream which then will generate lots of problems in the downstream portion now that said also expect evolution of your board it's not going to stay the same so i know you can't see much of the detail in these pictures but Something to know is this is the same board for the same, for the same group of people. It's an aggregation of several teams. So it started with something like this. It was very crude, very simple, and it didn't have much detail. And eventually, over time, depending on what the team needed to see it in, in the revolution, we changed the board once, and we changed it again, and then again. And then it ended up being a much more sophisticated board after a few months. Right? So your board will start in one, in one shape, and as you're asking these questions, and learning how to read information that comes from it, it will evolve. So I expect evolution. Start somewhere and evolve from there. And finally, boards are social devices. We build them so that we can have conversations in front of them. So be mindful of this idea that visualization will affect the things you talk about. What you choose to visualize or not will shape the conversations you have. So if you want your team to focus, for example, in, 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 in the customer, do you have things on the board that actually speak about customer needs, customer problems, customer deliverables, or is all in, inwards looking and internally, internally uh, coming internally from the team? Right? If all I visualize are just my in implementation tasks, well, that's what we're going to talk about. But if you, if you want to focus the conversation on the customer, maybe you should switch to a customer recognizable type of item, right? So visualization will affect what you, what you talk about, so be mindful of that. All right, so this is essentially the whole content. If you're interested in uh, reading more about this in more detail, I've written a series of articles. You can go to our website. You will find uh, more, a little bit more detail about all this material. And with that, Thank you so much for your time and